to start by reading the book of Mark. Ready? ready? We're going to read the first eight verses together and look at the story uh, as Mark unfolds it. And this is what it says. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem All Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes one who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Amen? All right. We'll start with a question this morning, which is, do you know, does anybody know, the color of hope? Anybody? (laughs) No, not, not, hold on, before you guess. Did Did you know that hope has a color? Did you know that? Now, I, this is not my claim, uh, but if you are familiar, there's a, Dutch imp- a famous Dutch Impressionist painter named Vincent van Gogh. Does everybody, we all know Vincent van Gogh? And he believed that. He believed every color has a meaning, has meaning. He believed color had the ability to transcend its mere visual impression. That when you saw color on a painting, as you looked at art, that color could speak to you in specific ways, just the same way that good music or good stories do. And anyone who appreciates, I mean, like myself, has learned to appreciate art and understands the impact and the point of colors and how they're used to communicate, to express mood and feel, we, we can agree, we, we understand that. But for Van Gogh, he really took it a step further. You could, you could read some of the stuff online, some of his, his claims, his beliefs. He took it a step further because he believed that as he was painting with specific colors, he was expressing or trying to communicate particular truth. He really believed it. And the most precious truth of all for Van Gogh was painting the color of hope. Now, the reason hope was so precious to him is because of his own ongoing struggle with his mental health. In his life, through his life, he suffered deeply, greatly with both, both depression and, and self-destructive patterns. Does anybody, you know, there's a restaurant in Guelph called Van Gogh's Year? And the reason is because in a fit of rage and, 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 and disagreement, he ended up cutting off his own ear. So we recognize this maybe had some issues going on. Yeah. Uh, In fact, you're probably even familiar with one of his paintings that he created during one of those depressive periods in his life. And I put it up there. It's The Starry Night. Does people, everybody know that? I've seen that. It's famous, and it's, it's probably worth, I think, millions. And he painted it when things were dark for him, when there was, as you can see, very little light, just specks in the, in the, in the sky. It was far away from him. And his story is, is that as a, a child, he grew up in a, a Christian home, and yet he walked away early on from his family's faith. And into, you know, that doesn't mean life is crushing, but for him, life did become crushing. Life was difficult. And uh, he wrestled with deep hopelessness and failure. And here's one of the things you know how he felt. Did you know that during Van Gogh's life, he only ever sold one painting? That's depressing. Yeah, that is depressing. Especially when you know what they're worth now. Right? That's, a, that's called a life change. And in the, that dark place for him in his life, the light of hope and love, when he experienced them, were both rare and precious to him. You can imagine when you actually feel hope when you're hopeless. It means so much. When the light breaks through, 
when the sun dawns. And you can see that, thankfully, by God's grace in, in, in his life, later in his life, really at the end, he began to rediscover the hope of the faith that he had long ago given up on. And he felt, as he felt that hope rekindled in his heart, as he experienced the warmth of God's love in his soul, he began to express it, continue to express it boldly in a very specific color. And that color is yellow. If you search online and you read much about Van Gogh, this observation will be made over and over again. That there is an ever-increasing presence of yellow in his paintings from the start to the finish. Until it seems, there you can see, it almost se- the yellow seems to almost overwhelm the whole palette. Like if you look at it, you say, what color are the paintings? They're yellow. Everything, by the end of his life, Van Gogh was saying, everything is yellow. There's hope. In everything. And the reason was Van Gogh was trying to bear witness to the hope that he had found. Trying to, to share its, the power of its message, very particularly through his art. Compare that earlier painting, that the darkness of the scary sky. Maybe we can go back there. Right? And then now look, and this is one of his last paintings. Is the, the, the painting is it's called The Raising of Lazarus. And what do you see? It's blindingly bathed in yellow. If Van Gogh could shout, the message would be that through Jesus, there are new beginnings. Hope can light up the darkest place. No matter how late it is in your life, no matter how dark it's been, that you can begin again in Christ. Do you believe that this morning? In fact, what you'll notice is, do you see Lazarus there lying down? Does he look familiar to you? Go back just one more to the paintings the, the yellow ones. See this? There's Van Gogh right there on the bottom right. Now go back to the raising of light. There he is again. He actually painted himself into the picture. He made Lazarus's rebirth, resurrection, an expression. His, his own face is an expression of his own hope and faith and belief in his own resurrection. He said, that's going to be me. Though I die, I will live again. Though everything is old and dead, there will be a new beginning in my life. And he was declaring this truth about grace, that grace is persistent, it is relentless, and it is wonderfully inescapable. And I tell you that this morning because the message of the gospel of Mark, when we read it, it also has a color. When you read the gospels, they have a color And if they did, it would be yellow. The gospel of Mark exists to color the world, to to color the world in the hope that Jesus brings. That's what everybody's longing for in the darkness. And if Mark, under the influence of Van Gogh, (laughs) could paint your portrait today, if he could get you seated seated down for long enough to, to paint your face, he would paint you all yellow. If he could paint the truth of God's grace on the canvas of your life, Mark would be painting everything yellow. He would put yellow recklessly, pour it out all over the place, covering and coloring every part of our lives. Amen? But knowing that just serves to highlight the wild scandal of the, the story, because this is that story is scandalous. To declare that everything is yellow, that, that God is making everything yellow, is scandalous. Because while most of us this morning are fine with a little bit of yellow in our lives, aren't we? Are, is everybody reconciled that there is some hope in this world? Yes. But we balk. We are challenged to believe that everything is going to be yellow, that everything is going to be made new, that that God wants every part of our lives to be painted with that hope of a new beginning, that there's nothing outside of his grasp and reach. In your life, is everything yellow? Is it all painted yellow? Or are there parts yet unpainted? Is Jesus all that you have? And is Jesus all that you need? See, that's the uncomfortable truth that we're confronted with in Mark right away. As he says, there is 
Someone coming to paint this world, he's coming to make all things new. And the question is, will you receive him? Do you want your whole, will you allow your whole life to resonate, to express his hope? Jesus wants his glory to cover the whole earth. And if you want to receive the good news, this is what we find in Mark right away, is you have to surrender everything to follow him. You must let him do what he desires. You must lay down all of your defenses, relinquish all of your prideful understandings, all of your fears, all of your sin, all of your shame. Do you see this morning, are, is there any part of those things that you are unwilling to surrender? Some of us, are we willing to surrender all of our pride? All of it? In every place? The way you look? Your thoughts? Your, your desires? Your wants? Are you willing to lay that down? Are you willing to give up all of your shame? Or do you still want to make a bed in it like we sang this morning? You still want to sleep there at night. Because that's what it means for someone to be saved by God. It means that you decide my whole life is going to begin again. Not just parts of it, all of it. Every part of my life, if it's going to be in Christ, has to begin again. It has to start new. Jesus said it to Nicodemus. He said, you must be born again. And we're not doing like a, like a half breed here. The whole thing. Every part of me born again. Every part of me surrendered over. Every part of me alive with grace. Every part of me yellow from the inside out. Shakespeare right, light, rightly said this. He says, God has given you one face, and yet you make yourselves another. And this is the, the, the confrontation of the good news, is that we do not need to hide or pretend anymore in our sin. We do not need to put up a mask before God or before anyone else. This morning, the gospel says, Lay it down before God. Don't hide behind anything else, but fully, Jason said it, fully expose yourself, open yourself to the Lord. Do you, I know I'm trying, it's a message we've heard so many times, and yet it needs to be made fresh again. It needs, because it's everything. It's all of it. And until we do that, until we make that choice, until we actually say yes to that, we will and this is Mark's message, we will be confronted as we are immediately in Mark by the voice of the prophet. Yeah. We're confronted by the voice of a prophet. Theologian George Eldon Ladd rightly notes that, there is a, that the great gift of the prophet, how many of us believe we need prophets? We could use with some prophetic. And this is what he says. The gift of a prophet is that they refuse to assume a righteous people. Now, have you been around prophetic people? Or have you ever had a, a prophetic moment? And by that I mean a moment of confrontation. Where someone is not appeased by your flowery words. Where you can't get around what's true. This is what he says. Abraham Heschel described prophets as, as people who are so gripped by God's righteous way that they, lived, they live in perilous defiance of people's self-assurance and contentment. I, re, I want to say that again. Prophets come, and they, and they live with a perilous defiance. They don't care. <laughs> That's another English word for that. They don't care about people's self-assurance or their contentment. And like God, the prophet speaks and he will not be pacified by empty actions. The prophet will not be pacified by religious ceremonies, big songs, great worship, te great worship teams, or even great sacrifice. 
They are not impressed with outward things at all. The voice of the prophet, rather, cares only for the condition of your heart. That's why there's no hiding. <laughs> we, can't, we actually can't hide before God. He sees all of it. They only care about the offering that comes from a broken spirit and a contrite heart. That's the only thing that will satisfy. And that's the confrontation that remains today. I want us to, to know this, that the kingdom of God the kingdom of God involves a confrontation with us. This morning, whether you intended to or not, you're in the midst, if you're willing, of a divine confrontation. Because Mark, it says, look at Mark chapter 1. He won't even let us pass the first verse. He says it. He says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then boom, right away he says, as it is written. In the prophet Isaiah, we run straight into the prophet John and his message. And what is John doing? He's crying out to us to meet him in the wilderness. Now, I'm not going to re-preach a whole sermon on wilderness. If you want to, you can go back and listen to Psalm 57 from last week. We know what the wilderness is about, what it's there to teach us. But he's calling them to go into the wilderness, us today, to leave the place of our comfort and our well-worn religious patterns so that we can hear a, an invitation about how to receive God afresh. This morning, this year, this fall, you have an invitation to receive God afresh. Not because he's come to shame you or judge you, but because he's willing and he's, he's ready to meet you. John came and said, you need to straighten the twisted paths of your desire so that God can rush into your lives. A prophet is often misunderstood because their most merciful act of love is the sudden flashing light that is in the darkness, alerting us to the unmoving boundary of God's righteous path. Their mo that's, that's their greatest gift of mercy. Like God, a prophet's loving words can feel like sandpaper, to our hearts. Sometimes it's that belt sander. Ever used a belt sander? Right? It is very powerful. You got to be careful with that thing. You're going to burn a hole right through the piece of wood. But sometimes the prophet's voice can feel like sandpaper. His loving words can feel like sandpaper. That doesn't make them any less kind because they wound the soul. What are they doing? They're, they're smoothing out the path. They're straightening it out. Why? So that God can be poured out. So that God can rush in. And the reason the prophet is so insistent, the reason why we can't compromise that this morning, is that the terms for God's promised salvation, what he wants to do in us and through us, through your life and mine, together, cannot be bargained. God makes no exceptions about this salvation that he wants to give us. His renovations spare no place in our lives. It's yellow, all yellow, or it's nothing. Isaiah said, he said, listen to his words again. Later, this is, it's the passage. I'm just reading the rest of it. We read it this morning. It says, he comes, God is coming so that every valley would be lifted up and every mountain and hill would be made low. God is laying claim to all, all the uneven ground would become level and all the rough places smooth. God is laying claim to all of us so that he can be in it all. So he can renew us from the inside out. And this is the, the heart of true repentance. It's, it's not just turning over a couple things to God. It's a complete surrendering. And Paul said, he said, if anybody is going to be in Christ, they're a new creation. It's not a continuation of the old, but an entirely new thing. And I want to just pause for a moment and just say, this morning, even if we have loved God and served God for years, decades, we all recognize that this message is not, is not just for people that don't know. It's for people that do know, isn't it? And we want to just say this morning, humbly, God, we need a new be I need a new beginning in my life. I need... 
I need to surrender again everything that I have. God, I don't want to live in between, in the middle. Amen? And we know this is Mark's passion because, you know, if you look at the book, it it says the book of Mark in your Bible, or Mark (laughs) as the title, but that's actually not the title of the book. What every commentator agrees is that the actual title is the opening line of Mark. That they, that's how they would do it. They just That's the title. And it's there in verse 1. Mark chooses to launch his gospel with a single and most important word to him. And this is the word. You can look at it. It says, there's no the in Greek. <laughs> he just says, beginning. Mark is declaring his gospel, the title of it is beginning. Beginning. This is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And what he's saying is, kind of like John. Remember John said, in the beginning was the word? He's he's reminding us of the beginning. Well, what happened at the beginning? The very beginning, we knew that into the middle of, sorry, at the very beginning, God spoke his word into the darkness and void, and he created. We know that's how it started. But right in the middle of that story as it unfolds, sin and then Israel, and then, you know, they're they're in slavery, they're exiled, all of that. In the middle of that story, Mark stands up and he declares the same thing. He says, remember Genesis 1? We're in the middle of this story. I'm telling you, there's a new beginning happening. He is now, God has now spoken his word again into the, this darkness and void of sin and is recreating once more. God has an agenda. He wants to recreate the world through Christ. Amen? Amen. What is beginning? (laughs) If you begin something in the middle of a story, it's a new beginning. So imagine what what Mark is saying. He's saying there's, he's promising, he's declaring, he's proclaiming there's a new beginning for the world, for the entire world. If you want to share, if you want to share the gospel, that's at the heart of it. You want to start declaring to people, beginning, there's a new beginning. There's a new beginning for you in Christ. It's a dawning of an entirely new age. I mean, that that message is like, it's world-shaking. I could shout it as loud as I want and it wouldn't be enough because the whole world has to hear this. The whole world needs to hear the evangel- evangelos, the, 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 the word of the angels to the world. And what's funny is the contrast. When I was thinking about that this week, I was like, oh, man. Like that word, beginning, new beginning, declaring that. We live, we are so caught up in other things, aren't we? We got caught up in, is anybody like looking ahead, reading the papers about all this election buzz presidential races. It's exciting. I get it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, okay. But we, we get caught up in that without realizing that there is a, another announcement. There is more news. There is greater news about the kingdom of God. And have you ever been at the beach? I, I remember we went to Australia a few years ago, and, and this beach we went to was absolutely incredible. It was, it was, I mean, the re, it was like this, set in this valley, there was kind of like a hilly mountain above, and the whole coastline is this strip of yellow or almost white sand. The beach was beautiful, and we realized after, the reason why it was empty was because there's probably sharks in the water, but, you know, (laughs) things you don't know, things you do know. But when you're, when you're there in the waves, and and you're playing about, you realize the power of it. And I, I have this picture in my mind of, you know, my brother Josh, and he's not the biggest guy. And, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of fighting the waves, and all of a sudden, he's like, he's looking at me on the beach. He's like, hey, and I, I can see the wave cresting behind him. I'm like, Josh, you got to, like, turn around. Turn around, there's a wave coming. And this is how we are, right? We stand here looking at the beach, looking at the po- politics and other news, our own dis- Desires and needs. All the while, the kingdom of God is breaking above us. And we got to turn around and see it. And that's why Mark writes so urgently. 
If you read Mark, I mean, we said it, Mark goes from story to story to story because he's, try, he's, he's like he's a foot race. He's, he's trying to beat us to the punch because he knows that God himself, this is what he's declaring, God himself has come in Jesus and through him he's starting a new beginning for every single person that exists in this world. And not just every person, but the whole world itself. It's all turning over. It's all going to be made new. It's all going to be yellow. And he doesn't want us to miss it. Archbishop, he's Anglican, William Temple, he said this. He said, the whole concept of the kingdom of God is so novel, it's so fresh, that only those who are willing to make a new start can even see it, let alone enter into it. Unless you're willing to make a fresh start, unless you want, unless that's burning in your heart, you won't even see it. Now, what you don't know is just how personal this message would have been for someone like Mark. Because Mark is spoken about in the Bible beyond just, you know, a, a kind of a title. Mark is, to, he's actually, even though he's, he's mentioned multiple times, he wasn't an apostle. Did you, did you know that? Just, just a little fact. Mark was not one of the 12. He was actually uh, Barnabas's cousin. And... His mother named Mary was in her house in Jerusalem. They would meet to pray. And so Mark was a cousin of Barnabas who would then go on these missionary trips with Paul. And they would, they would go out and they would declare the gospel. And that was going great all until the moment when Mark, and, and we don't know exactly what happened, but we know that Mark deserted Paul and Silas. i sorry, Paul and Barnabas on this trip. They're on, they're, on, they're on this missionary adventure. If you read Acts 10 forward, you'll see they're on these missionary journeys, and their lives are in jeopardy at every turn. It is high drama. They are fighting and speaking and, and not fighting with swords or anything, but they're fighting for their lives, fighting for the gospel, for influence. They're, they're flowing with the Spirit. They're moving in acts of power, and it is wild and crazy. And there's a certain point where I think Mark probably just had to step aside. He, he, he grew faint of heart. And it says he left them, deserted them, and went all the way back to Jerusalem to be at home. Now, you might know about this because Paul and Barnabas are talking later in Acts. And they go back to Jerusalem, and, and, and Barnabas is like, hey, we've got to bring Mark on the next trip. And Paul's like, I don't think so. I don't like that guy. I mean, I've forgiven him but I don't trust him. All right, that's just the truth of it. I don't trust him. Now, you can imagine, I mean, hopefully we're not, I can, we can all relate with, you know, Paul and being like, yeah, there's people that have failed me. Psh, just leave him behind. But here's the thing, Barnabas is like, no, no, he's got to come, he's got to come. And, and eventually it gets so, so ten, tenuous between them, Paul and Barnabas actually split. And Silas ended up going with Paul. But here's the thing. Imagine you're Mark. Imagine in the moment you're trying to live for God, all of a sudden it gets difficult and you fail. Has, can anybody relate to that? You don't do what you're supposed to do. And, it's, and it's, it's, you can't go back in time. Maybe you've repented. Maybe you've said, I, I want to try again. I wish there was another way. And you feel that failure. And I, we, can, we can relate. I mean, imagine Mark sitting in Jerusalem going, I'm not allowed on the trip anymore because I, I messed up. And that's, now, who are you, Mark? Oh, you're the guy that left Paul. You're the guy that couldn't measure up. What's the story of Mark's life going to be? Well, thankfully, Mark gets hooked up with another guy named Peter. You may have heard of him. And Peter, I think, is pretty familiar with the whole idea of a second chance. Right? Pretty familiar. And what happens with Mark and Peter is that Peter begins to tell Mark, he realized Mark's a pretty good writer, pretty adept. He's a good student. Mark, he begins to, to witness to Mark and tell him every, all the stories, the life of Jesus as he remembers it, all of the things. And Mark is like, we got to write this down. This has got to be, this has got to be declared to the world. Isn't it beautiful that how in, for Mark, this whole idea of a new beginning was like his personal testimony? I get a new beginning. And Mark actually 
is the first gospel we know, is, was the first gospel written. This is, Mark created the gospels. Everybody else copied. <laughs> what a story of a new beginning in the middle of the old. It's deeply personal for Mark, this whole message, and it's deeply personal for us. Now, what's hard to perceive maybe for all of us about the story is when we were introduced to John the Baptist, it's hard to, to know why, what made John so unique and why people responded to him the way they did. Because remember it said all the people in, in like Jerusalem, all Judea, they were flocking to him. They, there was, it was like magnetic. I mean, it, you, you'd drive, you'd get in a car, you'd, you'd take a boat, because there is that guy, the voice, crying in the wilderness. But we don't maybe understand why, what, what did he do? What was so special about John? On the surface, you might imagine, he was probably not unlike other voices at the time. I mean, John wasn't the only person calling for reform in Israel, calling people to, to, to change. And it's not unlike today. In our world, think about this, in our world today, it's full of voices calling us to action, to introspection, to new behaviors, right? The world is full of people messaging us saying, hey, try this, do this, go, go this way. You can't exist in our culture today without that perpetual buzzing of advertising and target, targeted marketing coming across your screens as you flip through, as you go through the channels, as you watch media, even as you visit your friends, all with the promise that they will spark change, the change we long for. That's what we're looking for. What are we scrolling for? What, 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 are, we, what are we spending hours on TikTok and Instagram for? Why? What are, we, what are we really looking for? I mean, there's probably a few reasons, but I think we're probably looking for some hope, looking for something that's going to spark our hearts, listening for something that could make us feel alive, listening for something to break up the monotony, looking for something to stir, to stir us to our purpose, to belong to, right? Is that true? I'm, I'm, that's what I'm looking for. And all of those places, they promise, they promise they know what's best for us, political change, they, they call us to it. I'm, this is not about po politics. I'm saying this, these, are, these are the voices. It's a world calling us. This is the answer. This will help you. Political change, self-discovery. Hey, did you know if you look, in, look inside, if you understand yourself, everything will change? What about wealth management? Do you know what your problem is? Is you just haven't thought about your future and what are you going to do when you retire and what are you gonna, how are you going to live? What kind of person do you want to be? What about, it's about the environment. That's the bigger story. It's, we've got to become aware, protect, and nurture the, the things we have. It's about health regiments, accomplishments, spiritual paths. Have you heard about this one? And all of these voices are, are out there. All of them are crying out. Voices crying out. And in Israel, all of that existed and more. If you were there, you'd be familiar with all sorts of voices calling out to you, promising. And, and they, weren't just, they weren't just advertising. They were calling you, saying, if your life lacks meaning, if you don't understand why things are the way they are, if you understand this, you'll get it. This will be the answer. You'd be familiar with these sounds, the sound of a Ro the Roman overlords who are saying, hey, listen, if you want peace and justice, you just got to comply. We'll give you a, a righteous society. Yeah, that's what, they were, that's what they were offering. Just let us conquer you. And then, you know, do things our way and everything will be fine in your life. All right, there's a couple of reformers who are about to raise their fist right now and be like, no, to the empire, <laughs> right? Alongside that, you'd, you'd have to put up with the constant droning of, of the Pharisees pulling, pulling you into their legalistic debates, so exacting in their knowledge of the law. You'd have to endure the snobby voices of a group, you may not know them, but they're called the Essenes. And they were, they were shouting in the streets, to join you, but they were so exclusive and ascetic, that means self-punishing in their devotion, that they were like, but if you have any disabilities, don't come. And if you're a woman, don't come. And if you're a child, don't come. 
Everybody else is totally welcome. <laughs> and, and then we'll be a secret society of, you know, uh, righteous people, and God will come and rescue the world through us. Right? You'd have to, that's, that's what you would have heard. You would have heard, of course, the loud cry of the zealots, the party of the people, so angry in their thirst to bring about real change right now. They're impatient. And they fought through violent rebellion. And you would have seen their advertisements along the road, Jew, young Jewish heroes crucified outside the city, right? All of these voices crying out, join us, do this. This is the path. But amongst all of those, the greatest, the, the, the voice that people heard was John. Why did they respond to him? Because amidst all of the noise, what was puzzling, puzzlingly silent in Israel of all places was the voice of the prophet. They never, they, they, you didn't just hear that every day. By that time, for over 400 years, Israel had been profitless. A ship without a rudder. Sure, they had people who filled the leadership vacuum, who, men who tried to interpret the law, who tried to interpret God's intent and said, this is what will happen. But for all of their efforts, the one thing they could not claim was that they had heard the voice of God. There was no one who saw beyond the veil. And that's what made John so unique. Because dressed in a garb of, of a wilderness prophet, right, eating honey and locusts out in the wilderness, in the mold of, 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 of Elijah, the one they were maybe looking for, he raises his voice into the, the deafening silence. I mean, it wasn't quiet, but the deafening silence into the void, and he raised his voice with hope, and that hope cut through. Yeah. This morning, I want us to hear the voice of God, that this book, Mark, that we're reading is prophetic. It's a confrontation to us. Nothing less than confrontation, but it's a confrontation about hope. And I want us to understand that. Because why do you think people flock to the wilderness? And I'll tell you this. They didn't run into the wilderness to be berated by some, some angry, self-righteous, camel-skin-wearing vegan. All right? <laughs> they did not go because they were looking to be punished and beaten and, and, and scolded. I mean, John did scold them. He did, he did correct them. He did confront them. But why did they go? It's this. It's because as he spoke, they began to imagine their own new beginning. All of a sudden, they realized that what they had been struggling and suffering and living under, the, the mask that they had been wearing, the self-righteousness, the fear, all of it could begin again. John saw right into their hearts and he said, it's a, there's a new beginning for you today. There's a new beginning in the place that is dead and, 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 and rotting in your life. That place, there's hope. It was because they were intoxicated with the hope of a future that they had only dared to dream about. The arrival of God coming not to judge the world, but to save it through Jesus. Coming not to destroy the world, but to redeem it and recreate it through Jesus. Because he came preaching about forgiveness. He said there is forgiveness for all who want it. They flocked to the wilderness because in John's words, they felt the magnetic buzz that you feel in the middle of a thunderstorm. Have you ever felt that? My brother-in-law, Adrian, took his family hiking a couple weeks ago to this, this really, like, I think a 19,000, I think it was a 19K hike up the mountain to this summit, this peak. They live out in Alberta. And he said on the way, he said it was beautiful. He sent us videos. I, I wasn't going to show them, but it's beautiful, incredible summit. And he said as they came down, though, they were descending in through the clouds. And he said they got caught in a thunderstorm. And now, that doesn't sound that scary. I mean, hey, a little bit of thunder. But when you're in the clouds, this is what he said. I'll read it. He said it was amazing, except that we got caught. 
The air, he said, was so electrically charged that you could hear crackling and feel the buzzing. He said, they were, they were with, hiking with poles, and he said, my poles were shocking me as I stood there, and the kids, all of their hair stood up on end. I mean, hopefully, I'm, I'm glad they're alive. But this is what I think it was like when they heard the voice of John. There was something magnetic crackling. They felt the thunderstorm of God's grace. God's inbreaking kingdom looming over them, ready to rain down. Does anybody this morning need a new beginning? Do you need a new beginning? Do you want a new beginning? Because that's why we're here, because in Christ it's possible. In Christ it's today. How did they respond? How did the people then grab hold of it? Mark tells us this is what they did. They confessed their sins. They just, they let it all out. They confessed their sins. And I don't think they did it begrudgingly. They just went, I don't want anything, maybe with tears in their eyes, I don't want anything to stand between me and and the storm of God's grace. I want to get caught up into it. See, I think... That, in, that intoxicating hope had unlocked doors that they were previously unwilling to open. And I'm praying that that's true this morning as you, as you hear my voice. And it's really true. Divine anticipation and holy longing are much more powerful than fear. In his book, True Face, author Bill Thrall says this. He says, when grace introduces us to repentance, the two of us become best friends. But when anything else introduces us to repentance, it feels like the warden has come to lock us up. See, I don't think, I don't think John was knocking on closed doors. I think John, as he spoke, people just went, yep, come on in. Nothing to hide here. Shine the light on every part. I'll tell you, I I can see it now. All of these things are nothing compared to the glory that's to be revealed. Do you realize the good news of Jesus has come to transform the way that you think about your sin? That's what repentance is. It's realizing that sin and the story of sin are nothing compared to the story of God's grace and forgiveness. There's there's nothing that grace can overcome. See, God's good news of grace is the key to overcoming shame and secrets in our lives. It is the power to break the deception of sin's lies in our hearts. This morning, you might be considering what confession, what things you have been holding back, what, what secrets or lies or fears you have been living in. And you want to decide this morning, is it, am I willing, am I ready to confess that? And what I don't need this morning is you to stand up here and shout it out to everybody. I don't need that. What the Lord needs is you to share it with one other person and to say, God, I I recognize this this is what I've been holding back. Right? It says in the Bible, confess your sins one to another. Don't hold anything back. Why would you? See, it has the power. Grace has the power to unlock us so that there's no secrets, nothing to hold us, no no ties that bind. We only fear confession because we don't actually believe or haven't accepted that we are welcomed as we are. We don't believe maybe that God lays claim to our sin, that, that somehow we're alone. But I want, can, you, can we declare this this morning together? You're not alone. Look around, you're not alone. This place, this family is not meant to be a chamber for secrets. It's meant to be a place of freedom for all of us. That as we open our lives, as we share them humbly before God together, God would set us free. You, your sins, I'm going to tell you this, your sins will not define you. That's the message John came saying. Your sins aren't going to define you. They don't need to. 
There is forgiveness. There is a new beginning breaking out even now. It's looming right over us. It's here. And when we begin to believe even faintly in that hope of God's grace, courage arises in our hearts. Courage to to tell the truth and to trust God. Amen? And this is the joy of starting, (laughs) is is when we begin, we we get to go in the opposite direction. John, not in Mark's gospel, but in other places, he, he told people, if you have been stealing, then give it back. If, if you have two things, give one away. If you've been hoarding, give it away. Do the opposite. If you've been hiding in isolation and shame, then expose yourself and listen to others. If you've been selfish, then give. If you've been fearful, then trust. If you've been a victim, and acted, or if you've acted like a victim, not been a victim, but if you've acted like a victim, then take responsibility. It's a new day right? The unexpected thing, oh, I'll say this. What did they do? They named what they had trusted and loved and depended on more than God. That's what confession is about. They confessed by name the paths that they had taken willingly away from God and the ones that they'd found themselves walking on in ignorance. What they knew and don't know, right? That's what repentance is about. It's not making a list of sins and then submitting them to someone. Repentance is more about the conversion of the whole mind and heart. It's about understanding what our hearts have been desiring and how we failed to connect those places to God. That we've been turned in the wrong direction, unable to hear the call of the good news as Jesus declares it. And this is the unexpected thing that we find about confessing the sinful pathways that we've been taking is that as you do it, you discover that confession before one another is actually the pathway out of shame. I remember in moments of confession, things that you have held, I've held, I held for years, I, that I believed they were forgiven, but I, you know, I just, you felt the weight of them. Mistakes and failures. And I remember looking in someone's face as you confess your sins and watching them smile and, and, not, and not discard you and not turn on you, but welcome you and say, in Christ you're forgiven. It's under the blood. Amen? It's a beautiful thing. It ties us together in, in, in friendship in ways that is hard to imagine. The power of shame is broken when a company of friends who accept you allow you to confess your sins and then help you. This morning, God's forgiveness is ready to pour on us. And then there's the last part, really, this this one little nugget. The one last reason I think they were so willing to repent and so excited about it and so willingly, not just confessing their sins, but then just saying, would you plunge me in the water? Just like head, put, put my head all the way under. That's what baptism means. It means immersion. It's like fully, you're just, you're, you're dunked. The clue is found in John's message. This is why. Mark puts it succinctly. I didn't put that succinctly. John, John wasn't calling them to follow him. He was calling them to follow him and waiting for the one who would baptize him with the Holy Spirit. John's baptism was a preparation. They they were forgiven in in hope. They were waiting for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is the forgiveness of sins. That's John's call. There is one mightier than I, and that's, that's all I can say this morning. I'm not here to absolve your sins. I in myself, I have no power. I can't, I can't do that for you, except, thanks be to God, there's one who's greater than me. In Christ. We can, right? But not on my own. There's one who's greater, and he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And that's what it it means. It's a new beginning. The, uh, The offense of the gospel is right here this morning. Do you want a new beginning? Do you really want it? Can you see the kingdom? Can you taste forgiveness? 
Because this is, this is Jesus' words. He says, for the one who seeks to save their life, anyone who seeks to keep anything back from the yellow, <laughs> if they seek to save it, they'll lose it. But this morning, anyone who gladly loses their life for Jesus' sake will find it. Amen? So why don't we stand up? There, there's a, I just want to lead us in a time of, of confession. And I don't imagine that this is exactly the perfect setting for some of us to do what we need to do, to say what we need to say. I, I don't imagine that you're sitting exactly beside the person. Maybe you want to share anything you need to confess this morning. And that's okay. What I want us to do is I want us to, to name it together before God. The places, if there's this morning, just maybe there's three or four things, maybe there's one thing. Places where you have been trusting in something other than God. As we were talking, I'm sure there was something that came to mind. And, and the joy of repentance is that we get to turn to God this morning. We get to turn and face the wave and say, I'm looking to you, God. You're the only hope I have in this. I don't have a plan out of it. All I know is I can lay it before you and I can name it and I want to bring it into the light. And I don't want, I want to put down the mask this morning and I want to ask, Lord, come and, and, and meet me here today. Amen? And no one may know what it is. Maybe no one's heard it before. Maybe this is something you've held in. I don't know. But this morning, by the Holy Spirit, know that there is a new life for you. There is freedom and forgiveness when we confess our sins and we turn to God. Amen? It's the, it's, it's the dawning of a new age in your life. It's the beginning of everything. It's nothing less than that. So this morning, would, would we do that together? Would you name, and we'll just take a moment, maybe the team can just play for a moment. I'll lead us in a prayer, and we'll just leave some time in silence. And you can name that before God, just formulate it. And, and then I want to encourage you after, as we, after we pray, just... We're making a commitment here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name this with someone else. I'm, I'm going to name this to someone else to say, hey, would you help me with this? Because I don't want to be held back anymore. Right? Amen? So let's pray. Lord, here we are. Here we are, God. Just as we are, God. And we thank you, Father, that your grace, like a tidal wave, is around us, Lord. That you are calling us and urging us because of hope to lay down our lives. And God, the offense of our, of our pride is that we believed that we could do this on our own. That we could manage it. That other things could take your place. But Lord, we see the foolishness of it, Lord. And today, Lord, we, wanna, we want to, to lay that before you, God. We want to confess our sins so that we may be forgiven again and that you might break out and flow down, that you might raise every valley, tear down every hill so that the glory of God would flood our lives that the presence of God would fill us with peace. So this morning, God, we, we just take a moment to reflect as we stand before communion and we confess our sins, Lord, to you. So let's just take a moment to do that.
you, God, this morning. Lord, let there be nothing between us, God. Lord, when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we thank you, God, that as we take the bread this morning, we remember, Lord, this is your body broken for us. We remember, God, this is the new beginning that you promised. We thank you that you're faithful and to complete, Lord, what you began in us, Lord. Lord, we take it as a, as a sign and as a symbol, Lord, that we are truly yours, that you hold us, God. So together, let's lift up the bread and let's partake. And we remember, Lord, this is the blood of your new covenant with us. Sealed forever, Lord. God, we thank you, Lord, that it is, whenever, whenever we drink it, we're to remember what you've done. We're to declare it and proclaim it, that we are forgiven in Christ, that we're a new creation in Christ, that we were created in Christ for good works. So God, as you, as you pour out your grace upon us, fill us with your spirit this morning. Amen? Can we pray that together, Lord? Fill us with your spirit. Renew us in your mind. <laughs> Let us think the thoughts of Christ. Let us know your heart, Lord. Fill us with your spirit, God. Yes, Lord. Let's drink together.